Hello and welcome back to Where Are All My Friends. This is a cool episode this week. It is with Hannah Gross, who is the vice president and head of West Coast A&R for Mom and Pop Music. So she joins this week to basically explain how she got to where she's at now, like going from all of her chapters of working in music and everything that led to her getting this incredibly cool title and just killing it at Mom and Pop. So we talk all about her come up story, but we also get into something that I love so much, which is actionable steps and things that you can do to get to spots like that. And at the very end of the episode, we were gonna do a bonus Patreon Q&A, but it ended up being so good that I'm just gonna leave it in for this full episode. And it was just rapid fire round of like questions for anyone who's either trying to get signed to a label like Mom and Pop, or somebody who's trying to work in A&R and have a position like Hannah. So just all around a super fun episode, but also a very helpful episode with actionable steps. And that is everything that I love. And one other quick note before we get into it is if you've been listening to the podcast for a long time, you know that I had Finn McKinty on a while back. He has a YouTube channel called The Punk Rock MBA, and he also has a podcast called The Punk Rock MBA. And it's about darn time that I start shouting my friends out and showing them a little bit of love. And his podcast is very similar to mine in the sense of talking to creative people who have made a business out of doing what they love. And his guests are so good. He's had Anthony Fantano, Lil Zan, Allison Hagendor from Spotify. On top of that, something that he does that I really, really love is he'll do bonus episodes where he breaks down specific like business bits of creating podcasts or making your own YouTube channel. It's more than just interviews and that's something that really inspires me. It's my favorite part of his show. So I'll leave the link to his show in the show notes and description of this show. And yeah, just go check it out. I genuinely really like it and I really like what he's doing. Okay, let's get into this episode. Enjoy. Where are all my friends? Hannah Gross. I am honored right now because it is a privilege to get you to do any kind of podcast so thank you for being in a friend uh, thank you for being a friend thank you for i guess believing in the podcast enough to show up i'm legit honored thank you thank, thank you, you so for much. having me you know i i like like you said i it's not that yeah i just don't do this kind of stuff i feel i'm a very behind the scenes person nowadays yeah. so it's, it's weird for me to be the one on the mic i guess well you know what's funny about that is i remember like one of my eras of working in music was me going from being a tour manager to working in a label mm-hmm. and i wanted to learn from the greats of like labels and other managers or just anyone behind the scenes and there are so few articles or good press or interviews mm-hmm. of, with those people. And that always kind of bothered me because I was like, I, like, what's the easiest way to learn is like find who's doing the best of it and see what they're doing and it's ask questions. It's not a very public and, persona. Exactly. Yeah. And there's so many music podcasts where you're talking to lead singers about how they wrote albums. And it's like, that's awesome. Like, I genuinely do like to know that. I just feel like there is a lack of people killing it in the industry that are probably making your favorite artists re- or your favorite records from your favorite artists. I can podcast. I've done this. You've done it before. Yeah. Um, and you just don't hear from them and they're making such big waves behind the scenes. And I feel like that is you. So that's where I'm excited to have this conversation. So again, thank you. Of course. I'm happy to be here. I think it's also that the reason like a lot of people that are kind of behind the scenes on projects, the reason that like there isn't a ton of like A&R articles or like industry people articles or whatever is because like we never want to take the shine off of our artists. That's, you know, yeah, like it's never about me that when I work true. on a project. It's about the person whose project it is. And that's kind of the mark of a good team It's like when your team's not trying to take right. the shine. But that's like, again, that's where it's like weird with this podcast is I intentionally want the people that people like don't pay close attention to and you have to dig to find because I've found in my experiences from touring to management to labels, some of the most interesting, remarkable, inspiring people are the ones that you really kind of have to do your homework to be like, (laughs) wait, you did this and this? So again, thank you. And here at this spot is my little time where I get to make you sweet brag. So for anybody who doesn't know who you are and what you do, what are you up to now? What's your position? Some artists that you've worked with and that that quick little picture. Um, Okay. The sweet brag is such a great term, by the way. Oh, yeah. Um, Sweet brag. I am the vice president and head of West Coast A&R at Mom and Pop Music, which is... uh, 
a great indie label, um, probably one of the biggest indie labels in the US, let alone the world. More um, than I realized. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Yeah, it's bigger than a lot of people realize. Um, so yeah, um, and before that, I worked at labels like Electra and Atlantic, and you know, I've done consultancies, scouting, internships, all of that as well beforehand. So um, I know we were just talking about it because the last time I saw you was at my birthday, which yeah. was last week. Yeah. Um, and I'm 28 now, which marks 10 years of doing all this. A decade in music. Yeah. Which is crazy. Mm -hmm. And I think that that'll be like a cool place to really dig in and start this is I'm curious where you had that moment of finding music to some capacity and just being like this, this is it. Like this is career time. This is more than a job or like where you found that spark and that passion to be like, I'm going to do this. Yeah. Ooh. Um, it's definitely changed a lot over the years too. Like I didn't wake up when I was five years old being like, I'm going to go be an A&R executive. <laughs> right. It's not like one of those kid, like firefighter <laughs> right. astronaut type. No, uh, it's not. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I grew up on the West side of LA. My family's not musical at all. I mean, no one even like our parents made us play instruments, but like no musical heritage. I don't know anybody in the industry really, or I didn't growing up that whole thing. Really? Um, yeah. So when I was young, I just started music lessons like a lot of other kids did. I was like four years old and I started playing classical piano. When I was 13 or 14, I started playing jazz. I started playing pop music and then started writing music because I was really fascinated by like, you know, knowing how chords go together and all of that and putting them together myself. And then in high school, I scored for my drama department mm -hmm. um for all like the productions we had or whatever i was like writing the music that went behind a lot of things or just doing a lot of like nerd thespian stuff which was fun um but yeah so i ended up so getting you were in, in it oh yeah, yeah i was like a full-on music kid like i was half and half i was like jock half the year i played competitive volleyball in southern california and um i did theater and music the other half of the yeah because you kind of fucked yourself up with sports we were talking about this like <laughs> you do have like sports crazy injuries. sports injuries well also when i was younger like my plan was to play sports for a really long time uh, um when i was going to college i was thinking about you know do, did i want to play volleyball in college or all of that um but i had gone really into music by the end of high school so <laughs> i had led with that and it ended up working out because i got into nyu and I went to NYU um, to Tisch in the Clive Davis Institute. And I actually got in for performance, which was hilarious. Whoa. Because your girl is not an artist anymore. <laughs> but Whoa, I got but in wanting to be an artist. That's a whole lot of your life of like doing artist stuff. Like, like yes and no, though. Because when I showed up, okay, you have to imagine like this is a very like talented group of kids that are in this class, right? And a lot of them are very successful today in their own right and whatever they do. But like I showed up and I was like, oh, my God, a lot of these kids are doing like real artist stuff, like <sighs> recording music, playing shows already, like making music videos, all this stuff. I had not done any of that. Like I wrote songs in my room and I like had someone help me record them for my college application. Like that's as, that's as far as I've got. I've yeah. gotten at that point. Um, so I get in and. Then I kind of look around and I see like what a life of an artist actually is, right? And like gigging all the time to no one for a certain amount of years and, you know, doing all this stuff that nobody cares about and like making no money for a, such a long time. And I was just like, oh my God, like this is like cool, but I I can't do this, you know? So it's at that <laughs> point where you're like, all right, no, we're going to pivot was, a little. Well, it was at that point where I realized the writing part of it was what I really wanted to do anyway. Oh. It, I didn't need to be the per the person on stage. I, I wanted to do a lot of the writing and just be part of the creation of it. So I switched my focus to songwriting in my sophomore year. And I had started interning because we had an internship requirement and I found out what A&R was. And I was like, oh, this is what my brain kind of does anyway. So I did a double focus in A&R and songwriting for college. Whoa, what a like illogical yet cool path of you like finding it the right way. It's also, it's interesting because it's really, um, I found it's it's interesting to tell people that like you come from a creative background, but you do the business side yeah. because everyone has a different take on it. Some people are like, oh, you you couldn't do this, so you went and did this, or um, it's weird that you, you know, have that creative tie, but it's only kind of really helped me, which has been really great. Oh, I think it's huge. Well, I mean, I was professionally songwriting when I 
graduated from college. Yeah. And I was doing that for a little bit, but I, I was having like, I was having a self esteem like moment of like, can I actually do this for the rest of my life? And I was just like, no, I need to go get a job and like be responsible and do all that. So, I mean, I still do both to this day, but I mean, in terms of what I spend most of my time on day to day, um, yeah, the A&R stuff, I kept coming back to it. I did nine internships in college. Like I was working all the time. I was in the studio until 2 a.m. for classes. I was running to two internships at the same time my freshman year. Like I went crazy. Okay, because I think that's such an important thing to talk about because like when you're finding your lane, like obviously you can be the person that from five years old, you knew you were going to be an artist and it was just that. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people know they're passionate about a specific industry or something like that, mm -hmm. but don't know exactly where they fit. And right? I think that it's not necessarily ever one thing too. Like I do a and now and I do it for a label specifically, but I mean, whatever helps me, you know, add to a project that is musically exciting and has great songs and great artistry. Like that comes from so many different angles. I know so many people who are super creative and do that from a management perspective or a publishing perspective or a sync perspective, um, music supervisor, whatever. So we're all kind of close to the same things. It's just what roles you have in that process. Yes, but the thing that I was gonna say there is like I always get so excited when I work with somebody, especially at a label, when they have been there and done a bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. Because to be a great executive or to, to really own your role, the more jobs you've done and understand on an actual level, mm -hmm. the more you can get it. Like when you need to go and talk to somebody and they're working in this department, you're not just going there with some obnoxious ask. You're like, yo, I've been here. I know how this works. Mm -hmm. I know how you feel when somebody approaches you wrong. I know how to properly ask and when to ask. It's and a well-roundedness thing, like, definitely. I think that it just makes you so good at what you do when you've been in other roles and positions. Well, especially too, like I would say a &R is probably the most niche, but also the most like music specific part of being at a label, right? Yeah. Like, like a marketing person or a streaming person or a radio person doesn't have to give mix notes. You know, it's like, it's right. very different than, than the rest of the sphere that you work with at a label. So I was really happy that I kind of had that um, like music school skill set and Sure, when I was in a six hour mixing class in college, I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna die. But, you know, looking back, it's really great now that I can understand, you know, that verbiage and I can get on the phone with a producer or a mixer or a master and know exactly what technically is wrong. And I can identify that and have that conversation. And it takes a lot of the back and forth out of the equation. Being able to do all of those things, like I'm kind of saying it again, but like, I just think that that's so important. Like, I think that when you work with somebody who just gets it on all of those levels, it's really cool. And it's it just makes it easier. I think all people who deal with mixers or producers or whoever, like they should know what they're talking about. Like it's especially when you're representing a company who's very music forward and wants to, you know, not waste anybody's time and, you know, wants to make sure that you get the best product possible. Like so many people in the industry, like given like notes or just like don't have the same um, well, skill set. Well, that's a crazy thing about music is you really don't need a degree or a formal education. Mm -hmm. Like me, like I came from literally just touring. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, oh, I understand how to work with artists on that side. And mm -hmm. then I got a job at an indie. But like, I don't have that education. Well, I so mean, there's no. Yeah. I mean, I'm really lucky that that was my college education, which really it, it, the program was kind of more like um, grad school, but for undergrad. Yeah. But um, I mean, if you really wanted to, like for people who want just more of like the, you know, finishing skills, like pick up sound effects, you know, like pick up like a book. Like there's so many things that, you know, you can just learn about or there's um, great audio training exercises that you can just like download and listen to all the time. And it's like those are things and skills that, like I said, I definitely in the moment was like, this is complete and utter bullshit. But now I'm just like, this is so important. You Yo, know? Okay. Well, that leads to my next question, which is a little bit outside of like your story, but I'm just curious as an A&R, when you listen to new music, does it come to you as a feeling? Like, can you listen to something and does it, do you go off of more emotion or more technical knowledge or do you find it somewhere in between? Um, I think it depends on what it is because mm. like, if it's like a song demo that someone is sending to me for like someone else to cut, mm. like I don't think of it as like a finished record that I'm like thinking, oh, like what are the notes here? I'm thinking of it of like, hey, does this song like 
hit me in that way that I need to be. Yeah. You know? So and, that's a little bit like turning your technical brain off and just. Oh yeah, I, I really don't think of myself as very much a, a technical listener until I need to be. Like um, in the beginning stages, half of A and R is like knowing if a song works through a voice note. Like it's not. Yeah, <laughs> you think that's so great? Like cool. Half the time you get sent stuff that's like someone like waking up at 3 a.m. and it's like blah, 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 blah. like does this melody work you know yeah so, um i'm really not a technical listener until it's time to like turn on those like put on the special headphones use the special speakers put it in the car you know like if I, if that's not what i'm listening for i really don't go off technical at all so it's a huge point of differentiation it's like mm -hmm. one part of you is like discovery and does this song work for this or that and then the other part is you're putting together an album and you're like this needs to technically be good here and here's where i can give mixed notes or here's where I can give notes. Yeah. And, well, yeah. it's really twofold in general. I mean, everybody thinks that A&R is just like going out to shows and, you know, signing things and it's really glamorous and partying with people. And it's it's really not that. Um, <laughs> I mean, half of it is going out to shows, but um, I would say the first half that, you know, is really bringing in the artists or finding the artists first, obviously, on however people find. I mean, everyone has their own platforms that they use or tastemakers that they like or whatever. So it's finding something that you like, which is already hard because there's so much music in the world. Yes. Um, finding what you like and then um, connecting with them, seeing, you know, do you have a manager? Like, is there a team? Like, do you have momentum going forward? Like, what are your plans? Because if someone's like sitting in their bedroom, not doing anything, doesn't want to work with anybody, but you love their music, it's also like not going to work. Right. Um, so, so yeah, um, it's, finding something you like. It's connecting with that artist. It's courting them and making sure that, you know, especially if a lot of other labels are involved, it's making yourself stand out and kind of showing why, you know, you're the right fit or, you know, or seeing if you're the right fit and then trying to show them why you'd want to um, be their partner. Um, and then that's just like phase one. Right. Right. That's what everybody knows. That's, that's what, what everybody, everybody knows. When you think A&R, that's it. Exactly. It's, like, it's the talk it's and like it's the, the meeting the artist. Like and smoking the... a cigarette in the alley in New yeah. York, like uh, like outside the venue, you know, and everyone's <laughs> like, hey, by the way, like yeah. that doesn't happen. you um, razzle dazzle. <laughs> right. <laughs> Me just being like this random alley person being like, <laughs> hey, I really liked your set. <laughs> no one does it's like, that. Don't worry, Hannah's got this. You're just at some <laughs> random venue posted against a wall smoking a cigarette. You're like, hey, kid. <laughs> Literally me. <laughs> um, but that's the whole joke, right? It's like when I first started interning at labels in AR, um, one of my intern supervisors like he was like, Let me give you a crash course at how to find an AR in a room. Uh -huh. Right. And everyone knows, right? You're at the show, it's the people in the back at the bar on their phones. Yeah. <laughs> Every single time. If it's New York, you're in a black leather jacket. Yeah. That's it. That's all you need to know. So that's the first part. Yeah. That's so, the sorry. first part. First part of a &R. And then the second whole part is what happens after you sign the artist, right? It's making the record. It's making sure, you know, the right people are involved, that things are going on time and on budget and um, really connecting with your artist and saying, hey, what kind of record do you want to make? Like, who are your dream collaborators? Like, you know, play me some of the stuff you've been working on. Like, let's brainstorm and let's talk about how these things can be leveled up. So it's making the record and making sure that that gets done. Yes. And that's the whole second part. Yeah. And yeah. that is so interesting because that takes a certain amount. It takes skill in every different sector where you have to be able to like have social skills where you have to be able to talk mm -hmm. to people and like deliver hard news. And then also deliver good news oh, and get people hyped. Oh, it's all about personalities. Yeah. All about personalities. But then you also have to hear and like help direct an album in which way it's going. You have to understand mm -hmm. budgets and you have to understand where you have to have prioritize things. Like you have that's to where pick it your gets battles crazy. too because like, you know, a lot of the times artists really, I mean, a rs are there to help you and they're there to kind of guide you and well, the right a rs are there to guide you and say to you, and say to you like, hey, I know this is what you're doing. Like, let me help you accomplish that. Yeah. Right? And a lot of people have this taboo stigma about the label trying to come in and like fuck up your shit, you yes. know? And Sorry, can I hear something? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, run it. Run it. Um, fuck like, yeah. And, and, <laughs> thank you. And they're like, oh, like I'm not going to listen to anything they say. Like they signed me. Like this is my record, like whatever. Yes. But the whole point is like I signed you because I like you and like I like your music and I'm not trying to fuck up your music. Yeah. Like I'm trying to do the thing that you want to do. I just might have a little bit more experience of how to do that. Right, right. right. And obviously, if like 
it's a huge artist. Do whatever you want. Right. Like, but if it's someone who's really wants to make an impact on the industry, maybe a debut or whatever, I'm like, hey, I know what you're trying to do. You don't have to do what I'm saying. And this is, of course, going to be your decision at the end of the day. Yeah. But I really think this might be the right angle to take. Yeah. And that's something that I've learned. Like our mutual friend, Johnny Minardi, like there was one time <gasps> when I, I was. Johnny Minardi. I'm uh, president of the Johnny Minardi fan club. I'm, I'm here for it. One thing I remember when I was managing an artist, I came in super hot and I had a product manager and we had this whole plan of like releasing a bunch of videos and I was like dead set on it. Mm -hmm. And the product manager kind of like reeled me back in and he's like, yo, like we should do this, this and this. And I was all mad. I was like, no, it has to be this way. And Johnny checked me hard. He was yeah. like, I would have said the same thing to you. And I was like, what? And I was like, oh, like my well, ego was all it's upset. Like, it's all a conversation. Too. Yeah. Like if it's something where I'm like, hey, I really think that we should do this single first because this is the reason. Right. right. Like because this is, you know, from all the projects we've worked before, like we we really get support here instead of yes. here. And it's like as long as you hear it out, that's what's important. You have to just be open in well, general. And that's what I was going to say is I think that it's a two way street where like I ultimately ended up like listening to Johnny on that. And he was right because the videos didn't get delivered in time. And had we gone with that, it would have fallen apart and we would have looked silly. So mm -hmm. he was just trying to give good advice from his mm -hmm. experience. And I think as an artist or as a creative, when you're working with a team, it's like you signed with them for a reason. Like mm -hmm. you had to have believed in them. So like they're there to help you. Yeah. And then for you on your side, you have to believe in the artist and know. And it's like, yeah, cool. Like, Here's what I suggest, mm -hmm. but if you need to to die on yeah, this hill, I've, and... I've never been an A and R who's like, "Hey, you're doing this, or it's not coming out." Right, like that's not my style. It's like I sign people because I already like what they're doing, not because I want to change what they're doing. Yeah, and you're there to help, exactly. Or I'm I'm there to just kind of like show them how their music can reach more people. That's yeah. really my goal, right? And obviously, doing that in a way that is in a musically authentic way too. I'm not trying to make anyone seem like a sellout. I'm very um, I'm very cognizant of, you know, especially when you start at one format with the intention to go to another, not to take that too fast. And there's so I also I'm pretty lucky, too, because when I first got into the industry, my boss was a GM and then a president of a label. And so I had to do a and r and marketing at the same time. Oh, wow. So you had like a crash course and just learning. Exactly. Because it was a smaller team, I got to do a lot more and I was traveling. I was I mean, I brought in my first artist when I was 23, 24 years old. Holy. So like, I mean, that's pretty young for while I was still being an assistant or a coordinator or whatever it was, you know? Yeah. Um, so but I that was, shows you care, right? Oh, like, definitely. You and don't want, that's like extracurricular. That's like you giving a shit. That's no, you well, being like, yo, one of my in One it. of my like number one pieces of advice for people when they're first starting out is like, especially as a woman too, like there's a little bit of a different standard about what it means to be an assistant. And- it's so, so, so important that you treat your, you know, creative acquisitions and your A&R as highly as you treat your admin work and making sure your boss is taken care of and all of that stuff, too. Let's I'm so glad you said that. And let's talk about that for a second. Like, Do you feel like there are a lot of women doing what you do? Yes and no. I mean, I obviously there are more men doing what I do than women. Yes. Um, but I think. It's interesting because I know a lot of women in publishing yeah. um, that are amazing a and in publishing. And I do know um, I'm really lucky that I'm friends with a lot of women in A&R that I kind of came up with that are on the label side. Yeah. Um, I think that at least in my experience, and I could be totally wrong, but I think I know more women in a and for publishing than I do for records. Interesting. Why, why do you think that is? I think that it's just, it's a really interesting combination of how you come up in the industry and you know, who you start working for. And it, it's all really different. I mean, like I said, I think that there's probably not a ton of higher level executive women in record A&R because I think, you know, when you're young and you, like I said, you're running around all these shows, you're doing all this work, you're doing whatever, you have really long days, you're being in the office, especially in New York where it's really office oriented and like being in the office is very important. Yeah. Um, you come home really late the last thing you want to do is like get on your computer and try to search for artists that you can bring in to sign right totally. and you have to like that's the whole point is like i was bringing in artists when i was younger because i probably didn't even prioritize it enough as i should have yeah. you know um and i think the double standard is that kind of guys who are assistants treat like prior to that more than they do the actual work 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, I, again, it's like, and that isn't to slam, by the way, I know a lot of amazing guys in this industry who were great assistants and that I worked with and, you know, shout outs to them. But I don't think that that is the norm. I think that, you know, if I had slacked off on some of my assistant jobs in order to go meet the artist or go to the studio or go do whatever, like I would have been fired. It gets painted in such a different light, which does feel kind of like a bullshit double standard. Oh, I think that it's like, it's obviously it is and it sucks. But like at the same time, I kind of feel bad for a lot of those dudes because like I learned what my bandwidth was. And like I could do so many more things at once. I could, you know, be doing this on one hand, doing that on the other. And I think that when it comes to high pressurized situations, yeah. you want that kind of experience. Yeah. You and want like, to be like in the thick of it. What I'm kind of hearing in you explaining that too is just like work so hard that you can't be denied. Like that it's completely oh, like. that is the perfect way to categorize it because every woman in this industry will tell you you have to work twice as hard in order to get to the same distance. Right. So if you want to get farther, you work in three or four times as hard. And like, I I was from the moment I was applying to college to doing getting into internships to doing as many internships as I did to make sure I had a good resume. Like yeah. by the time I was applying at jobs, I was at three labels, two publishing companies, a music supervision company. Like I was like, I need to be a no brainer. Yeah. 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 Which again, kind of BS, but like on the more positive side, it's so rad to talk to you because I think of anyone listening to this podcast where it's like, that's not the point. The point is you can fucking do it because look oh, at where you're totally. at. Like you, you are can totally do it. You have it to work your fucking exam- ass off. Yeah. Guaranteed. Yeah. But like, I remember one time I had a really great confidant who was, you know, uh, an executive level woman at um, the company I was working for. And I just said to her, I got so frustrated one day because, you know, there was a guy that got hired that was two years younger than me and had, you know, no experience, but was hired in a title over me and was making twice as much as I made, whatever, the the classic. <laughs> and um, I just said to her, I was like, how is this happening? Like, I'm doing this, this and this. Like, how how does this happen? Like, how do I eventually like, you know, sh- prove to people that I, I'm worthy of doing more than what I'm doing? Yeah. Right? And she just said to me, she was like, you know, Hannah, it seems like it's really shitty right now, but you have a completely different skill set than that person does. And like in the long run, night and day. I love that. I love that. I I feel that. Like, I feel like, I feel like everyone feels that right like you'll yeah. always see people everyone has their own advantage and disadvantage but there everyone can relate to the times where you're looking and you're like really yeah. really but leaning into that as a strength being like okay that's fine i have a different skill set it's true and it's really hard too because you definitely compare yourself when you're younger um it is i, I mean i compare myself sometimes now you know yeah, absolutely and, um, it's unfortunately human nature oh totally but i mean we're also in such an industry where you know everyone's doing similar things like not similar but we're all just still trying to make sure that like we're on top of everything and yeah. luckily i've gotten to a point in my life where like i don't really like get jealous of my friends anymore or any of that like i am so happy for my yeah. friends whenever they have any yeah. success um but it wasn't always that way and that's yeah. totally cool to admit that too no i, I think know? about i often think about that and i think that it takes like we're all like it's survival then happiness kind of thing of mm-hmm. like when you're trying to make it in the music industry, it's just survival. It's blinders and you're just doing everything you can to pay rent and stay afloat and survive. Mm-hmm. And it's hard to celebrate other people's victories or to be there or understand other people because you're just so tunnel vision survival mode. Sure. And then once you kind of get to that spot where you're like, all right, I did it, you kind of become a little more comfortable with yourself and you can look around and celebrate other victories. I think for me too, when I was younger, like when I was like a fresh assistant or, you know, paying my dues years as I call them, right? Your early 20s is you're paying your dues years. I mean, unless you start later in the industry or you start, you know, when you're a teenager and some people do that too, you know. Um, But I really took the end of my college years and my early 20s is like, I didn't sleep. Like I didn't do any of that. I had the incredible energizer bunniness way to just go out and be doing whatever I needed to do, right? Yeah. And it's kind of like, cause those are the years where you can do that, right? You're not tied to anything. Like 
I think whenever I meet with young people, right, and they're trying to get into the industry. I was just going to ask you this. Oh, it's 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 so hit or miss because sometimes they're like, I will do whatever it takes. Yeah. And I'm like, sick. Yes, do that. Yeah. And then some people are like, yeah, you know, it's really weird. Like, I just like don't think I could do those hours or like I like. I don't think I could do that amount of money. And like, to be fair, I think that young people are incredibly underpaid in the industry and Dude, I will fuck and up. I will go with that till the ends of the earth. But um, I will say you like, th that's your time. That's your time to like, especially when you're talking about like sprinting and like really getting an edge up, like that's when you have to stand out from the most amount of people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so now I look back and I'm just like, holy shit, how did I, how did my body do yeah. that? Right. Yeah. Like, how did I stay up until four in the morning once a week doing a certain spreadsheet for a meeting the next morning and then do 1 a.m.s every other day because I was going to three shows a night? Like, how did I do that? Right. But now, because of that, my whole point, I guess, of this whole, you know, um, storytelling. Yeah. Is um that back then I was planting seeds to be in the industry. And now I'm planting seeds to be in the industry for a very long time. And that's a very different thing. Right? But now that I'm a bit older, you know, th it's not the same routine. It can't be. And it's taken me a really long time to wrap my brain around that because for such a long time, I was like, if I'm not going 100 all the time, I'm yeah. not working hard enough. Yeah. And now I'm just saying to myself, like, whoa, okay, if I do that for like the next 10 years, I'm gonna be dead. Mm -hmm. So now I'm very focused and zoned in on like, cool, how do I make my days the most efficient they can be? Yeah. But at the same time, you can't overrun yourself every day because then you're not gonna be there for a long time. Yeah. So yeah. I'm very, you know, as I think now, like how I, you know, spend my time and do my work, I'm just like, cool, I've done enough for today. Let's recharge. Let me, yeah. Let's make sure that I feel good enough tomorrow to do my best work. But it's cool that you now, like, again, it's just like you you had those paying your dues years mm -hmm. and you worked hard and now you have this crazy skill set where you understand all these facets and you're in this position now where it's all recognized and you're just ripping. <laughs> and I love that. And again, it's like- Just ripping. Just ripping. over here ripping. That's the Andrew word of the year. I love that ripping. word. It's not how I would describe my day to day, but it's cool. <laughs> Well, hey, I'm here to gas people up, you know. <laughs> but like I just again, I, I I don't mean to to frame this episode of like a chip on the shoulder of like, oh, it's BS being a woman in the industry because oh, there's no. all these things. It's like it's fucking I, badass. Yeah, and it's it's like yeah. to me, I'm like, look at this person mm -hmm. killing it at this I, title I just now. Did, I'm um... like, look, Hannah can do it. <laughs> Other people go do this. Like there yeah. needs to be more of this. I just did um you know, I, I just got on Clubhouse. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I I think it's super weird for me just because like it's so not my world. But um a couple of my friends and I were invited to do this like women in AR podcast. Cool. And um or Clubhouse, whatever it is, the streaming yeah, thing. Yeah. And um <laughs> it was really interesting because a lot of us you would expect to have the chip on the shoulder. And I think in some ways we do, but it's more that like we stand out and that's such a good thing in it. Yes. You know, yes. like I've been in green rooms after a set where there's 12 other guys, you know, being the industry high boy. Yeah, um, leaning on the wall, smoking a cigarette. Hey, kid. Not even, just like, <laughs> right. <laughs> We're bringing it back. Honestly, worse that than comedy that. comedy is what we honestly, call a callback. <laughs> honestly, worse than that, like more cliche, but. I've been in the green rooms, you know, waiting for the band with 12 other A&R guys, and I've been the only girl, and that happens very frequently. Yeah. Now it doesn't happen as frequently, thank God, but honestly, I fucking thrived in those rooms because one, if the band was younger, which I assumed they were, um, I'm closer in age, I don't look like everyone else in the room, I have a totally different energy, yes. and when I start talking about music, because I know something about that, it's like, oh, cool. This is someone that I might like actually hang out with or chat with or like has good taste or whatever. Yeah. And all those dudes blend together at some point. Yeah. It becomes like a like a copy paste video game character where you're like, wait, what? And like, especially for female artists too. Can you imagine like going into all of these record labels? They're all dudes. At, well, at that time, right? Like now they're not, but like going into these record labels and it's just like copy and paste men in suit, copy and paste like office 
plaques, whatever. Right. Right. And it's like, if you're a female artist, like you want to connect with a girl half yeah. the time. Maybe not everybody, but it's really comforting. Dude, and to have you somebody know? in your corner, it's like, yo, Representation, cool. it's super important. And I think nowadays it's super important to have every kind of person represented in your a r department. Yes. Right? Oh my God. Race, that's gender, sexuality, the whole thing. Because like, that's what artists are. Yeah. You know? Have you seen that new Netflix movie, John Favreau, The Chef? Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Where yeah. he drives around in yeah, the food yeah, truck yeah, yeah, with yeah. his kids. So there's a good context. He drives around in the food truck with his kid and like quits being the big restaurant guy and is like going around like doing the real thing on the street, right? And so there's this one scene where he has this 11 year old kid with him, right? The whole time. And he's showing him how to make the sandwich, right? And he's like, okay, put it on like that, spread it like that, close it, make sure like the the panini press, thing press is yeah. greased, like close it, look at it. This is how you know it's done. Yep. Take it out, whatever, blah, blah, blah. That is exactly what mentorship is. Yeah. And that is exactly what so many females don't get in the music industry. Yeah. And the thing is, is like, I didn't have anyone say to me like, this is what we should be saying in these mixed notes because can you hear that? That's what I got in school. I was lucky. Yeah. But like women aren't getting these like mentors that are like, this is what you need to hear for. Right. This is who you need to know. And I believe to further go on that analogy, mm -hmm. he makes the kid throw a sandwich away. The kid thinks that this it's is just good control. enough. Absolutely. Yeah. And this I is love the standard. that This too. is the etiquette. Like if someone's upset, like this is what you go and do. Right. You don't get that. Like he threw that kid's ego away and like having mm -hmm. a good mentor also does that. They show yeah. you what to do. They show you the ingredients, but then they also show you like, here's like, if and you mess to, up. And to be fair, I'm not saying anything about like guys that I've worked for. Like I was very lucky to have good bosses in my life or in my career so far. Um, but I think it's another level when you have two guys yeah. really like in that camaraderie role with each other, sitting down, being like, let's break it down. Yeah. And because, you know, I think that a lot of, you know, male executives maybe feel weird about it or like they don't want to overstep or like feel like they're invading someone's space or whatever. But and obviously, you know, you never want to come off as like a creepy boss or something like that, which I totally get. But, you know, you don't have that step by step when you're young, when you first enter the industry. Yeah. And it really what it really affects is your confidence, because if you don't have that kind of this is what you do, let me show you this is confirmation that you're doing what you should be doing. You're always guessing. Holy fuck. God, that's so true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really does come back to that. Mm -hmm. And then. Do you know what that leads to? Please. Confidence yeah. in the workplace. Confidence to do what you're doing and do it well. Yeah. I kind of trialed and errored it so much. and You forced it. And I asked the right questions too. I, forced is the wrong word, but like <laughs> Foraged you- Foraged it. Yeah. Foraged that's, it. That is yeah. what it is. Yeah. And I think that I asked a lot of the right questions. I think that I was lucky that I kind of had a head up on the technical side, but you know, it was something where, first of all, when you get a job, the real world is different than school. You know, you're dealing with real people, real personalities, weird email etiquette, like all this shit that you've never done before, right? And so I think that I was really lucky that I had a boss at the time that I could go to and be like, hey, this person seems mad. How should I handle this, right? Or like, how do I navigate the situation? Yeah. And that was really great for me. And I also think that because I kind of had the background that I did, I was a little more in tune with you know, really deciding what I felt intuitive about musically. Yeah, God, that's so huge. And that's like so much of what I wanted this episode to be was just like hear your story and hear like every bit of it because here you are now at this spot where it's just like, I want you to be an example. I want like other people to hear this episode and be like, all right, cool. Like Hannah just set the bar. Like here she is like and, running And to it. be totally fair, and you don't have to keep this in the episode if you don't want to, but I mean, I think it's also really important to know that when I left and when I came to Mom and Pop, yeah. like it was a lot of people like had questions about it. Really? Like, they were like, here's this 25 year old girl who just got a vice president role. Like Yo, what happened there? Oh, yeah. No, seriously. Like I got like, I uh, my friends picked up a lot of shit and they're like, Yo, somebody thinks that like, you know, someone or blah, blah, blah. The answer to how you get a good job, you know what you're talking about. And like, you know, the difference between relying on radio and what a good marketing plan is. Like there's, it's all these things where it's like, I was very young to do a lot of things. I was very young to sign an artist. I was very young to, 
you know, get the role that I have now. And I think a lot of people were really not happy about that. Um, but if I was a guy, they'd be fine with it. That is a weird double standard because you're totally right. Mm -hmm. You're totally fucking right. Yeah. But again, as you explain your story, it's like, well, yeah, like you do have the experience because you've been doing this and you put those crazy hours in in New York and all yeah. of this. I mean, I think, you know, it's all good because I would hope and my goal is that once I have a conversation with somebody and once I can actually like talk to them about what I do and, you know, the things that I've done so far, they'd be like, oh, OK, I get it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's not like I'm like some like weird clout chasing girl who like went yeah. after a job and got it because I was so charming. Right. Like what you want when you talk to people is for them to understand why you do what you do. Right. And yeah, I mean, right. Like yeah. when when pe when you, you have people watch your podcast, you're like, oh, this isn't just just another guy with podcast. Like he really does his homework. He really like seeks out what he wants the world to see from it. Yeah, and so, like just that feeling of like, oh, this person gives a shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or has done the work. Yeah, That's you're the right. Point. Yeah, it's That's more than point. gives a shit. Anyone mm -hmm. can give a shit. They've done the work. Yeah, and it's and to be fair, like you have to put yourself in really tough positions in order to do the work and to have the resume. And a lot of people, you know, can't be in that position for you know one reason or another. But I I genuinely do believe that this is an industry that is so not reliant on going to college on specific, you know, resume shit. Like you can do it all yourself if you want to. It's just putting in that time to really make yourself aware. The yeah. whole point of AR is just being aware. That's it. Like if you know what's going on, you're golden. My whole job is just trying to know what's going on all the time. Yeah. Which Damn. can be very overwhelming sometimes because you're responsible for knowing the world of music. God, I love that. <laughs> and I normally conclude the podcast with a question that's like, if you could go back and give yourself any advice, whatever. Mm. But I actually kind of want to frame it a little bit differently because I hear your story and I the question that immediately comes to my mind in just natural conversation is like, what kept you going? Like, mm. good Lord. Like you- A lot of tears in the it. office, um, yeah, like, in like, the bathroom. What was that? <laughs> like- what was that motivation? Like, what kept you going to get to where you're at now? Um, I think it's a few different things. I think that you come up with people who are going through the same things you're going through. And I think having those people to lean on is really important. And I'm going to be lifelong friends with a lot of those people, not to be too hokey. Um, but I, I think yeah. that's a part of it because, like, I remember the first time that I really, like, fucked up in the office, right? I'm just like, oh, my God, my Worst end, feeling. right and i was just like freaking out and then you have someone out there that's like i did this you're fine yeah right yeah the person that and, tops your fuck up and <laughs> right or then you learn oh i didn't do that i'm fine yeah. um but no i think that's really part of it i think that a and r in general i mean the music industry is hilarious sometimes you know we all think that it's hot shit and that the you know emergencies or fires we're putting out are real things and they're not right like there are people who perform surgery every day. Yeah. Um, but I think that another part that keeps everyone going is like when you have that moment where your artist levels up, right? Like that keeps you going a lot. And like even just recently, like one of the last artists I signed is Del Water Gap on Mom and Pop. And he just played Red Rocks for Mount Joy. And it's not that I never thought he was gonna do it. He it just came a lot earlier than we all expected. And he just fucking like killed it, you know? When you see clips of that performance and you're just like, holy shit, like it's this moment where there's like, you have artists that start off at pianos, Mercury Lounge, Moroccan Lounge here, whatever, yeah. right? 250 cap or less. Yeah. Then, you know, they play the 500s and then the thousands and whatever, right? Like the first time I saw, hmm, the first time I met Wallows was at Mercury Lounge and like, or at South by two. And then, you know, now they're at 5 million monthly listeners. Like there's so many things that like you, you see like these level up moments and yeah. you're just like, oh shit, like this is really cool. And like yeah. a lot of people are connecting with this and like, this is like why I do that. Yeah. It's like that very real tangible progress and seeing lives change and like being mm -hmm. able to like, like I believe in this and, and feel that feeling. And then it's, 
that much bigger. You're like, Especially oh. in the live scene. Like I'm I'm very um live centric as an A and R person. Like live right. is very important to me. It's just like really cool. Like that's why people work at labels. That's why people work as managers or do whatever. It's because there are these moments and these milestones. They're just like, holy shit. Yeah. Like it's working. Like that's what's important. It's so funny. Like I love that you say that because I have a similar feeling. Like whenever I was working with artists, be it like tour management or label or anything, mm -hmm. just the feeling to me of seeing these exceptional people create something that I genuinely believed in. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter the genre, didn't matter whatever. It was just like, wow, this is sick. You made this. Mm -hmm. And then being able to help make that huge, mm -hmm. like just that feeling of being a part of it and helping something that you believe in mm -hmm. get to this tangible level of success. You're just like, holy shit. It's a really like, I don't know, full circle moment. Maybe that's the right way to say it. But yeah. like you look around, you're just like, fuck. Yeah. Like you're not selling insurance. Like no. you're not making some big company it's, a ton it's like of extra art. money. You're it's like, the art aspect. Yes. Yeah. You're validating art. Yeah. And also, I think selfishly as an A&R person, I mean, you asked like, what advice would I give myself? Yeah. Right. Like, I think the hardest thing for me was always trusting my intuition and my confidence and my taste. Yeah. Right. That was always the thing that I was like, oh, well, so and so doesn't like it. Maybe it's not that good. Right. But when you sign something, you see a level, you see things get bigger. You're like, oh, I fucking know what I'm talking about. Like, sure. That person didn't like it. Like. Yeah. Great. You know, yeah. it's like, I think that's the advice I would give my, my younger self is like, trust your intuition. Like your intuition is there for a reason and you like things for a reason and people connect with things for a reason. And a and R's job is to have that taste, to have that judgment call. God, you knocked that out of the park. That's nice. so good. Well, damn, I feel like that's an amazing place to leave the episode. And like, thank you. Thank you so much for of that. Course. And it's, it's awesome to hear your story and hear you break those things down. So thank you. Love it. Happy to be here. Yes. All right. Let's do a quick little speed round. Speed round. Speed round. All right. Off the top. Uh-huh. A&R, how do you send an email that doesn't suck? Like to an a &R? Yeah, to you. Um, I want to pitch you something or and I'm an artist. How do God, I send an you know, email that so doesn't many suck? People, I'm, this is not going to be a quick answer because I'm sorry. It's a very loaded answer. Please. But um, so many people feel so many different ways about cold emails. Yeah. I personally hate them. Yeah. Like I get so many of them a day that it makes me angry looking at them, but I know that they're necessary so I don't get that mad. Yeah. I'll probably listen to everything, but I don't respond to everything. If I like it, I will respond. That's kind of how I take cold emails. I think another thing that I could take away from that is don't take offense if you don't get a response, mm. but know that if it's good, you'll get a response. Totally. Yeah. And I mean, find people on social media, go on LinkedIn. Like there's so many things where like you might know someone in common and you have no idea. Mm -hmm. Right. And imagine if you if they're like, oh, uh, Andrew's our mutual friend. Be like, hey, Andrew, um, would you mind introducing me to Hannah because I'm looking for an internship or something like that? Yeah. Whenever someone that I know introduces me to someone, I will go to bat for whoever that is. Yeah. Yeah. I think Always. honestly, you could even say like just sending an email just isn't enough. Like if you really care, you need to do better than that. Also, like you can if throw you're going to send an email, do not send a long email. That Essays are not read. I'm so sorry. Yes. But like send me couple sentences if you have any like highlights like streams or shows that you've played or tickets you've sold awesome put that in there put a link be like would love to hear from you yeah that's it yeah that's all you need. i really really like that <laughs> that's that's gospel right there mm -hmm. trying to go like i want to go like a little bit of like as an artist and a little bit of like you're chasing a and r okay um you are looking to get a job working at a label okay uh, I don't know how to preface this for like the speed round question, but basically what I want you to answer is like, mm -hmm. should you be picky about the job that you choose if you get any type of opportunity at a label? Ooh, like starting out? Yes. Oh, that's really tough. I have a very unpopular opinion. Everyone says just get the foot, get your foot in the door. Yeah. I don't. Really? No. Um, A&R is a very tough thing to laterally move into from another department. Interesting. Um, I, I rarely have seen it happen. Wow. It's like, I, I honestly believe that if you go to do a job, you're there to do that job. Yeah. And I mean, some people, sure, they do it successfully and like kudos to them. But like, it would annoy me as an employer, like being like, cool, you've been my marketing assistant this whole time. Like, I've really tried to like teach you what I know, but like you didn't ever really want to do that. Oh, yeah. Wow. You know, like that's not <laughs> You kind of just feel used. It's like, it's like, for example, like, 
when you intern but you re- in A and R, but you really want to be an artist, right? You know, it's like if you never tell me the whole time you're an artist and you genuinely just want to learn, fucking bring it. If you slip me a demo as my intern, it's not the best look. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. And it it doesn't show like if you're really confident in your path, like I guess it's one thing to like be in marketing and like be full force and then be like, damn, see something and you totally pivot. But like Mm -hmm. if you know you're trying to get to one spot, you almost get more respect in having the conviction of like, this is what I'm fucking going for. Yeah, I think when you show up to work, you're there to do the job you're hired to do. Yeah. like, And I'm not saying that you shouldn't have ambitions. And maybe that means you do hold out like. I worked at a coffee shop because I wanted to have the right job entry level. Sure. You know, yeah. and not everybody can do that. And that's cool, too. Um, but I would genuinely say, like, whether you're an intern or an entry level person or whatever, like be there for the job that you're doing, um, which I know is a Marvel concept. But I mean, I know people who are huge artists now, like full on recording artists that did internships at management companies, labels, whatever, didn't tell a soul. And then. The company that they were interning for was like, hey, isn't isn't this you who's on this chart we're looking at? And they're like, oh, yeah, it is. And it's like, have that be the reason people find out who you are. Fucking sick. Like that to me is the ultimate flex. That That's it. That's yeah. that answer. Um, how much do socials matter if you're an artist and you're looking to get signed? They matter. I mean, I think that there's a lot of different boxes you can check, right, in order to get someone's attention. Yeah. You don't have to have all of them checked. Everyone thinks like, oh, I have to have the streaming and the touring and the socials and the amazing music and all this stuff. Like those are the three to however many million dollar deals that you see because everyone has all their ducks in a row. So they're paying the big bucks, right? Like I don't think you need to have that in order to get the attention of a label. I think you need to have one of them. Wow. Ooh. Just have one box. It can be you're really good on social or your YouTube's really popping off or um, your streaming's really great or you sell a lot of tickets and you, you know- Have a great live show. Right, exactly. Like there's so many things or you just have a record that's so fucking good that none of the rest matters, which a lot of people wish that was them, but unfortunately it's not. Right, But that's that's the rarest of them all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like it is, I usually want to have like one thing of momentum that's going. Because the thing is, is like, like I said, there's so many artists who are in their bedrooms nowadays that like right. don't have a team, don't have really any plans or like any want to do things besides make music in their bedroom. And that's totally cool. And like you can do that kind of deal. But I'm personally interested in the artists who want to play the shows, who want to, you know, keep building and building and growing that audience, but also like collaborating on music and like working with bigger and better collaborators that they've always wanted to. And you know, build at radio and that whole thing. It's fucking sick. Mm-hmm. Unknown party foul as an artist. Mm. Something that you can do or Sorry. industry will see it. Uh, I mean, I guess you could say as a label, something that an artist can do where you're just like, damn it. Um, I don't think it's like really a party foul, but I think there's like a giant misconception that you should chase labels. Labels should chase you. Oh, great answer. Mm-hmm. I like that Which is obviously probably makes me worse in my job, right? Because I'm giving myself competition, but like, Ultimately, whether you're a songwriter, artist, producer, in any sort of creative field where you want to eventually sign a deal in order to finance you doing that art, yeah, you want to be set up well. Yeah. And if you are doing something on your own that's working, that's valuable. And you're bringing value already, which is going to further enhance your situation when you sign a deal, right? right? So like, I think... Also, the reason why I have an issue with a lot of cold emails is like you're already showing me that like people aren't going to you. Right. Make yourself valuable. Don't chase the check. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like the best the best advice I, I give to all of my songwriting friends, producer friends, artist friends, whatever. I'm like, just keep doing it and they will come to you. Yeah. If you build it. Yeah. They will come. That's huge. Piece of technology or piece of anything exciting, like anything you're excited about for the future. I'm excited about kids making themselves tastemakers which is a new thing yeah. like i think that you know with tiktok and all of those um platforms that to be fair like are so huge that a lot of it's crap and that's just how it is like there's no quality control on any platform right correct so like there's probably between 20 and fifty thousand releases on spotify a day right is it that much oh yeah uh. um 
And don't quote me, the last I checked, it was probably around there. But like, there's no one that's saying this is good enough to be on Spotify. Right. Right. Yeah. So I think that what's really cool is like, if you go on TikTok and search like playlist, or if you, you know, go on any of these blogs, it's a huge one to Spotify playlist, TikTok playlist that then translate to Spotify playlist. Like kids can really, that's another thing for A&R too. Always tell people to start a blog or start a playlist. Because like, if you can gain a following, it shows you have taste, right? That's so true. Yeah. So I, I'm really excited by like it not just being like, a, hey, go get an assistant job, build yourself up, learn how to yeah, make a record. Like make yourself a tastemaker. It's like less gatekeeping now. Like it's like literally like you have the internet. You well, can it's just make that yourself- there are more gatekeepers. <laughs> I guess that's true. No, it's true. <laughs> but it's like imagine if you have a playlist that like, I don't know, 100,000 people follow. A label's going to be like, who is this person? Yeah, exactly. Like, like you can, hey, can you put my artist on your playlist as well as looking for artists for me? How beneficial of a relationship is that? Massive. Huge. And last Put one, that on your resume. Yeah. <laughs> damn. You're dropping fire Bombs. with this. Yes. Uh, last one is just like the mic is on. Anything else, like anything you would want to say, anything else you'd want to share if anybody's listening to this or just any last thoughts of like- Like a- my, like pretend this is my, my Oscar speech and I'm like giving all my thanks. Yeah, like this is it. Like you're like accepting the award and <laughs> <laughs> your, your um, message to the people. What do I want to say? It's really easy to be trendy in music. It's really easy to be trendy. And it's a lot harder to have the real background and the skills and do your homework and like really- focus your skills and knowledge to like knowing the old school shit knowing stuff like analog gear or mixing or you know who has credits on what right like it's really it takes a lot of time to do all that and so many people don't do it and i think for me music in its entirety will always rely on a certain you know formation of a classic song right you can take it in a million different different directions it can be as weird as it wants to but at the end of the day when you're talking about music that works for a big mass of people it's because it's a great song and like if you can't understand why that is what it is then that's what you should be focusing on (laughs) bombs that's fucking huge cool i think we did the thing great sorry that was probably really long I don't care. That can okay. be, we can section that out. That was heat. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. So there it is, Hannah's story. I hope you liked it. Specifically, I really hope you liked that last bonus rapid fire Q&A there. Originally, that was supposed to be uh, exclusive Patreon content, but it was just so good to me that I wanted to share it with everyone. So on that note, if you do want to support the show and you did get some value out of it, go check out the Patreon. There's a whole bunch of other Q&As like that, a bunch of behind the scenes photos and bloopers and hidden playlists and uh, mail postcards and stickers and all that good stuff. So that's patreon.com slash where are all my friends. That's my shameless plug. Thank you as always for listening. Let me know other guests you want to hear from, and I will be back next week with another episode.